Hello there good people, what is up? Welcome, my name is Marco and I'm a full stack developer. This is the final episode of the URL Shorner series where I build a URL Shorner, the front end, the back end and finally I deploy the app. The time has finally come, today I will deploy the web app and to do that I'm going to use let's call it two pieces of software. The first one is Roku and I'm going to use it to deploy the backend, so the server side, and then Netlify and I'm going to use that to deploy the front end instead. There's going to be many things in this video so pay attention to each one. I will also focus on the part where I build the JavaScript for the front end so I will finally make the fetch call to my API to shorten the URL. Before starting though I want to address the little bug that I left uh, last week. As I said, it's small but it's risky. I don't want to leave it there and let's see what that is about. Okay, so our problem is exactly right here because if you notice, I'm just checking that the status is not 404. If not, I create this lag and I save it immediately. I'm not checking if this lag already exists. Now to do that, I to fix this, I am gonna use a loop that guarantees me uh, the fact that this lag is always going to be original. And what I like to do in these cases is utilize a while true loop. Now, while true loops like this are dangerous because they are basically infinite loops. This condition will never be false, basically. So I need to specify a very uh, precise exit condition. So let's transfer all this logic inside here and then I'll do something. Now, while this loop is active, I'm gonna uh, generate a slug and then I want to check if this slug exists. And I can just say like this, equal, and then I await. I'm gonna check in the URL models and so I'm gonna say find one. And that is basically enough, okay? Slug is equal to slug. Now to be a promise, I need to run the exec command. So, this will find one record that already has this lag. Now, let me initialize the new URL outside. Okay. So, these conditions, this condition to create the new record will be executed only if there is no checked slug. So, if my slug is original, there are no duplicates. I'm gonna save it. Okay, my new URL is going to be this. And this is going to create the record. And one important thing after this, I need to break out with the break keyword. Otherwise, I'll just go on and on with a, with a while true loop. If I save this, basically what I'm saying is for each loop, generate a slug, check if the slug exist. If it doesn't exist, create a new record and then break out of the loop. Otherwise, you get to here and obviously you just get to the top again. So this solves it, we're good to go. And just to be totally clear about this, this is a very small bug and it wouldn't have breaken, broken basically anything because of this statement. It's a fine one. So even if we had multiple slug with that name, with the same slug, I'm just returning one result. The problem is that I would have redirected the user to a different page. Good, we're safe. If you spotted this uh, problem in the last video, well then, good job. By the way, uh, let me know in the comments below one project that you might want to see on this channel. I'd be happy to work on it. This being said, it's time to get going. So, let's start. Okay, now it's finally time for the front-end JavaScript. So, first thing first, let's open the index.html and I'm gonna put it on the side so that I can see it both. Now make sure to link your uh, JS JavaScript file in the HTML so that it, it works. And the first thing I wanna do is actually uh, address this copy board because I want this span to have an action behind it which is to copy in the copy board. Now this is very simple and one thing that I can do is create a function first of all and I'm gonna call it copy okay and in this copied function I'm gonna get a target and you'll see why in a bit basically it's 
I have multiple of these copy boards and I want to copy just a specific target, okay? And this would be linked to the, to the event that is triggered. So the first thing I need to do is now select the element, okay? Because right now, if I click here, I want to select this, but this is a sibling. And there is no easy way to select a sibling. Now, what I mean by that, uh, this is the the parent element. So these are the two children. So basically, this pen is the sibling of this A tag, of this anchor tag. And there is no easy way. But what I can do, I can select the text that I want to copy just like this. Now, I got my target and I select the closest. And I need to specify what closest. So I'm going to say shorten URL. So basically, right now, I have this div. Closest select only parent element, not siblings. However, what parent elements, one attribute of parent elements, it's actually children. This will give me all the children inside that parent element. And it's going to be what is called an HTML collection, which is basically an array. And I can get access to these children, to the anchor tag, just by saying the zero index, so the first element. Now I am selecting this anchor tag. And if I really want to be more precise, I now can say in the text. And this will select basically this, this inner text or this inner text. Okay. Once I have this text, what I can do is just specify a navigator dot clipboard dot write text. I got here. And I need to specify what text. And this is the copy text. So now I have my function. I want to add the event listener and I'm gonna add it to the document itself. Because remember these divs which basically are the shortened URLs, do not really exist on the page until I create one. So I'm going to add an event listener to the page. It's going to listen for a click and I'm going to specify there's going to be an event. And right here I can make use of the event.target.matches. And it has to match a span. But it also, I don't want all the span of my page to be, to trigger the event. The target also need to have a class, so class list dot contains. What it has to contains? Well, it has to contains. Wait a minute. Okay, copy board. So basically, not only it must be true that it is a span, so like this, but it also has to have a class of copy board. Now this is specific for this exact element. Now that I have this if statement, let's start with console logging and see if, so let's print copy, okay? Now I need to run live server so that I can see this website live. And it is right here, wait a second, yep, like this. Okay, so this is the website uh, I've created last time. And if I open the console now, I don't have any errors. And if I do this, I got copied right here. If I do this, I got copied as well. Like this, I got copied as well. Beautiful. So now this function works. This event listener works. Close this. So now instead of this, I want to run my copy function. And for the target, I'm going to pass the event.target. If I save, we can just verify it by now. If I click, nothing should happen. If I go here and I say command V, as you can see, I got my text copied on the clipboard. So it works. Beautiful. Okay, now I can spend some time creating like this, these elements, so the shorter URL. And they're all going to go into the content um, div. So this is going to be the, the parent of all the shorting URLs. So what I can do, first of all, is to, um, yeah, I can put 
a URL on the page. Okay. And this needs some data. Or oh, maybe this needs the URL is just like this. What I'm going to do outside here, I'm going to just select these content div so that I have already or always have selected. So the content is equal to document dot query selector. This is the default selector. If you want to select something dot because it is, it is a class content. Now that I have this and I have to specify that it is a function, Marco. Yeah. And this is going to be an async function. No, it's not going to be an async function. So now that I have this uh, with the URL, I just want to have basically this entire thing copied. So I'm going to create an element, which is the shortened URL. And I create the element just like this create element good and I want to create a div and then I'm gonna have a class list and I'm gonna add shorten URL okay so basically what I'm saying is create a div and then add a class of shorten URL I'm basically I've basically just created this now that I have my shortened URL, I want to create an uh, anchor tag. So I'm going to create the anchor tag. Uh, let's say URL link. I'm going to document dot create element. This time I'm going to create an anchor tag. In this anchor tag, we have a class list of shortened URL link. This is important. Okay. Now, um, what I can do here now that I have this URL link uh, is yep select an href actually you know what I'm gonna do I think I cannot do it like this I'm gonna add the href we're gonna do it one by one URL link class list dot add I'm gonna add this beautiful thing right here then I'm gonna specify the most important thing which is the href the, the href how do you select the href yeah like this and this is gonna be equal to the URL so the one that is passed onto the function so now I basically created everything and I need to specify a text so dot text content is equal to URL itself. Now I've created this. Now I need to create the span. This is very easy because I can just say the copy board is equal to document dot create element. I'm going to create a span. This span I'm going to add a class list of copy board just like this so basically I created this now nothing happens here because I need to append all these divs so first of all I'm gonna append the URL link to the shortened URL so I select the shortened URL and I said append child hmm I cannot do it on one line because it's not a node. So I need to specify it like this, shorten URL. Yeah, to append something, it needs to be a node. And that wasn't because I have selected something else. If I do this, yes, append child. And what do I want to append? Well, the URL link, of course. And also I'm gonna um, append the copy board itself which is the, the, the span the little icon okay I don't know if this is gonna create a problem because this is not uh, a node so I'm just gonna do it like this this is one of the things you need to get used to it you need to get used when you're dealing with the front-end JavaScript it's just super boring like this so now I can put all the URLs on the page and one last thing is 
I need to append the shorter URL to the content. So now that I have it, I'm going to select append child. I'm going to append the shorter URL. Okay. Now I need to like uh, attach um, an event to this form. And the event that is going to be triggered is the request to my API and then the response we'll see. So I'm going to select the form, uh, shorten form is equal to document dot, uh, uh, it doesn't have a, a class, so I'm going to give it to, the, to that. I'm just going to say shorten, a shorten form. So now I have a class on the form. So I can say a query selector here. The query selector is gonna select the class of shorten form, just like this. Beautiful. Now, what I need to do is select this shorten form and attach an event listener. And what's very nice about this is that there is an event of submit that works with forms. So every time I submit it, I can have access to basically everything inside the form. The first thing I want to do is to prevent the default so that the page doesn't refresh. I'm going to uh, manage the, the request just uh, with JavaScript. So now that I've prevented the default, I need the data. And you can say just form data is equal to new form data. This is an object and you pass in the form itself. And now what this does, it's basically transform this uh, form into an object with a key value pair and the key would be the name of your input. And of course the, the, the value would be the value inside the, the, the input. So what I want is to make a post request to my API, to my server. Now my server is on localhost port 3000, but I don't want to art code it. So I'm just gonna give it to it with um, like a global variable and I'm going to specify, a, let's say API URL like this. And this is HTTP for now, because when I deploy it, this will change like a host 3000 API shorten. And if you notice here, it's exactly this route and it, it accepts post request. So I need to be uh, careful of sending post request. Now I got, I want my URL and I can get it like this. So form data now is basically a dictionary. It's an object and I can get the input inside just by its name. And the name here is URL. So just specifying URL. Now that I have the URL, I can make the request. So make request to API and I'm going to use fetch for this. Uh, to use fetch, since it's asynchronous, I need to specify a sync here. And I'm going to put a try catch block because I'm going to make an asynchronous call here and something can go wrong. So I'm just going to console error, the error for now. And I'm going to make a, res a request. So yeah, let's, call it, let's call it request so that it's not confusing. <coughs> Just gonna say await fetch and fetch wants a URL, which in this case is the API URL. And then it takes an object with the options. The first option that I want to specify is the method. This is gonna be a post method. The second is the headers. Okay. And this is important for like the server, the other end. And the, the, the only header I want to include is the content type. Not like this, but like this. And the content type will be application JSON. So that my API knows that I'm basically receiving JSON and it wants to receive JSON back. After the headers, I need a body. And the body can be as simple as, well, I can just put like URL like this right now, because I'm just sending this URL and it's going to have a name of URL. 
Now this request returns a promise and I need to process that promise into the response. And here I'm gonna await request.json. This is going to transform the response of this API into a JSON. Now, if you remember in the server, all the time that you make a request, even if there is a 404, my API will respond with a 200 status code. And this basically passes the ball of error handling on the front end. So I need to take care of errors on the front end. So if, he, if you put a URL that it's a no, not found, I need to be able to you know, process it on the front end because my API is just gonna tell me, yeah, look, there was a 404 and I'm giving back the response status, but for my API, it's a 200. So what I can say here is that, uh, of course, the request will return a status code and it can throw an error if it's not found or anything. But since I am sending from the front end the request, I know that I'm gonna find it. So what I can say, if you notice here in the server, all the time that I there is a successful request, I always I always have this short key. Okay, here if I respond like this, there is always a short key, and this is going to be in the response. So I can get I can use that. So if yeah, like this, good. If response dot short, this means if there is, I know that it was successful. So what I can do now is basically use this function that I've just created. I'm going to put it on the page. I'm just going to copy paste right here. And it's response dot short. Okay. Otherwise, if I don't have it, it means that there was an error. And the error, like in this case, I have a short, in this case I have an error and it carries a message. So I'm delivering a message. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put like an error message in the content. And since I have it selected right here, where is it? Right here, content, I can just select it and say inner HTML. This time I can do it because it's a response from my API. And I'm just gonna set it equal to response.message. So basically it's gonna say whatever message, whatever error message happened. And that's it. This is my error handling for now. Okay, it comes the moment to uh, verify if everything works. So I'm just gonna um, get rid of all this. This is one, this is two, this is three. And I'm gonna look at my page. Okay, so this is visible even if, even if there is nothing inside. There's an easy fix. I can go to the styles. <coughs> and look for the content. Which is... No, it's not here. It's here. And I can say that content is a display none, but content uh, like show, it's a display block. Was it? Yeah, let's put it block. Okay, so right now, if I save this, I'm not gonna see it, but if I put content show here and I save, I'm gonna see it again, beautiful. So what I can do is every time I put um, something on the page, I have to remember to append it and then content class list add and I'm gonna add the class of show. So I'm also gonna show it. So this takes care of everything. Now everything should work fine. Let's try and run the server. So npm run dev. I'm in the right folder. Let's see what it says. Okay, the server is running. Let me just see if I um, localhost 3000 API shorten. This is the correct URL. Okay. Let's see what we get back. I want to um, 
shorten a URL. Now you need to be specific because Axios works like this. If there is no HTTPS in front, it might throw some error. So I'm just going to say like github.com. I'm going to copy and paste it like here so that I got my HTTPS. So this should work and I'm going to shorten it. And I got an error, of course, because, okay, I think I found out the error. So first of all, in the server right here, uh, this uh, middleware was actually down here and you need to pass it like at the top. I don't know why, but now it works. Secondly, we cannot, uh, if you remember, this was like here. And the body doesn't want an object because there is going to be a problem when uh, the middleware is, is parsing it. So I need to stringify a JSON if I can do it like this. And I'm just going to stringify like a payload. In this case, I'm going to create the payload like this. Payload is equal to an object. Okay. And this is going to be the URL is equal to this thing. Okay, now it should be better. Let's see if the server is running. It is. Let's go back to our page and let's see if we can copy this. Copy paste. Let's open the console if there's any error. And let's see. Okay. Okay. Nice. So this is the, the URL. Now let's try and copy it. And if I do it like this, yes, it works. Okay. So this is fine. However, let's try and do this. Let's copy paste and do it. And I'm redirected to the GitHub homepage. That is fantastic, fantastic. There is one thing that I forgot actually. And in the HTML, no, it's right here. When I create the URL link, what I can specify here is URL link dot target is equal to blank. I don't know if this works, but basically what I want is when I click, it's going to open a new page. Okay. So now if I, no, I don't want this. I want the GitHub one. Now, if I do it again, I should get the exact same because there is already is one. If I do this, let's see if this now has a blank. Yeah, it has a target of blank. So if I click on this, it's going to open a new page and I'll be redirected here. Woo! It works. It works fine. Let's uh, try another one like um, Reddit. Now this is the home page of Reddit. Let's see if this works. I click here and I do this. This doesn't work. Oh, yes, it does. It was a bit slow there, eh? But now if I do this, I'm redirected to the Reddit homepage. Beautiful. It was a bit slow there. I don't know why. This is the request. Timing. No, well, it's not. It wasn't three seconds. Huh. I don't know. This was the first one waiting was it three seconds explanation <laughs> no, i don't want the explanation okay well fine it works okay it works fine if i do this i'm basically copying this okay it works fine beautiful we have our url shortener now it comes the time to deploy this thing okay for final deployment the first thing you should uh, download is Ombrio. This is kind of a package manager that you can install interesting softwares. And you just need to go to brew.sh and run this code in your terminal. 
if you have a Linux based machine like Mac OS or Linux. If you have a Windows, don't even worry about installing Ombre because you can skip this passage. But just like this, run this command on your terminal and it should be good to go. Now, when you install it, if you go to the terminal right here and you type brew, you should see something like this. This is basically the commands that you have available from Homebrew. And if it is installed, you're gonna receive this message. If not, you're gonna receive the command doesn't exist or something like this. Now that you installed Homebrew, the next step is installing Git. Now, Git is a, a version control language. The first step, if you have a Windows, you just go to the Windows installer and you uh, basically do the setup wizard and all the basic stuff. If you're on a Mac, this comes even easier with uh, Homebrew, the software, it's not the software, but the package that we just installed because you just run this command, brew install git, okay? And if you got a Linux, if you got Ubuntu, for example, you just run the app get, which is the package manager there, Fedora, DNF, basic stuff. Once you've installed uh, git, you should be able to access it like this. If I now say git version, I should get the version, of my uh, git, you know, so I know that this is installed. Next step on the line is Heroku. Now Heroku will be the place where I'm going to deploy the backend. And uh, there is a very neat command line uh, command that I can type in the terminal. If I got a Mac, if I got Ubuntu, you can use this. And if you have uh, Windows, you just download the installer and follow the, the instructions. Now, if you type this, you should be able to access Heroku from the terminal. And it works in the same way. If I now type Heroku version, I will now have Heroku. So these are, these are the fundamental pieces that I need right now. One last step is to create a Netlify account. Netlify is where I'm going to deploy the front end. So all the uh, client side things, JavaScript, the CSS, and you can either directly log in or sign up. If you log in, you can log in with your GitHub account. If you have one, GitLab or Bitbucket. And uh, this is going to be useful later because you can actually link the GitHub uh, repository or the GitLab repository directly to the, the website build. So every time you push some changes to the repo, Netlify is going to spot that and it's going to recreate and update your website, which is absolutely amazing. Continuous integration and continuous deployment. Okay, so let's go to the terminal. We're going to do everything via the terminal now. Let's clear the screen. Let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, so first of all, if I list my current directory, which is the where I created the, the project, you see that I have well, a file and then I have a client folder and a server folder. So my client folder would be uploaded on, uh, on Netlify, it would be deployed via Netlify, and the server folder via Heroku. Uh, now, they work through GitHub or Git, and I need to initialize a Git repository for this to work. Now, I could just initialize one Git repository for this whole project, and then specifying the options in Roku and Netlify, which of these two folders to look at. But that is a bit more complex. And I want to keep this very, very simple. So we're gonna start with the front end. The first thing you need to do, I'm going to go into my client folder, of course, okay? And in here, I got my public and my views. Now, inside here, I want to git init this uh, this folder so now right now i have created this dot git file and this folder is now being let's say watched by the version control and i have a i have access to many different options now for example i can get the status of my folders of my files and here it says that there are no commits there is some untracked files, and these are the files that are untracked. 
So what I can do here is just git add, and I could type in like public slash, but you can just do this like with a dot and it will add everything, okay? So now, now I have added everything. The second step is to actually put a git commit to commit the changes. And here I'm gonna have a little message like first commit. Now, my changes, my mm, commands, my changes, my files are ready to be pushed to a repo. However, there is no remote repository yet. And for this, you need to go to your uh, Git, Git provider, like GitHub or GitLab. And if you see on the dashboard, like something like new, and you click it, I can create a new repo and I'm gonna call it frontend uh, URL shortener. Frontend URL shortener, it's available. A short description, I'm not gonna put anything here, but anyway. And now I'm gonna create a repo. Okay, GitHub is very useful in this case because it actually, it's actually telling me what the passages that I need to follow. So we have added everything and we have added, and we actually committed it. So now we are at this passage, git branch. So now I just need to copy paste this command into my terminal. It works. The second command is actually to add an origin, which is this address. And this actually add this uh, repository into my so-called origin. If I now like try to um, print out the remotes, you can see that I have a remote called origin and it points to this URL, which is the URL of this uh, repository right here. And now I can push the changes and I just need to uh, run this command, which is git push u origin. Now you, there is no need for you to know what these flags mean. They're just basic um, commands. So you can just follow like this. If I do this, now I can see that everything went fine. And if I reload the page, I now have my front end, so my public and my views. I, inside here, I got my index.html. Now there is a small caveat here, and that is the fact that uh, Netlify basically wants the name of, um, of a folder to follow, to publish, and in that folder, it needs um, an index.html file. You could set things up differently with the configuration file, but again, that is a bit more complex. So what I'm gonna do, inside my client, I'm gonna make a directory called dist. This is just standard. And then I'm gonna move, okay, um, my public like here into the dist public. This command now, if, you, if I now list what I got inside here, you can see that the public folder has disappeared. This command basically moves the public folder inside the dist uh, folder. If I now list this folder, the public is inside here. And I'm gonna do the same with the views. And I'm gonna specify dist views, okay? So now if I list, I just got one repository, which is exactly what I want. Another thing, I need to expose my index.html. So what I can do is, again, move the index.html out of the views. And I can do this. So my index.html is in the dist, is in the views, and it's called index.html. And then I specify where it has to go, and it has to go outside. So dist index.html. This keeps the same exact name. If I now do this, and I ls the dist folder, you can see that I got the file, the HTML file outside, then I got my public folder and my views. And if I ls, so list the files in the views, it should be empty, and in fact it is. Okay, 
Now I need to push these changes because I've changed many things. And if I want a status of my changes, I just do a git status and it will tell me. So what I can do is just as before, git add, git commit, and I say uh, changed folder structure. Structure. And I can just do git push because the remote repository is already set. So I just do a git push. And if I go here and reload it, you can see that now I have just one folder inside here. I have the index.html and the public. The views wasn't even uploaded because it's empty. That is something, yep, yeah, it's fine. It's totally fine, don't worry. Now that I have this, I can go to Netlify and just log in with my GitHub account. Once inside here, I have access to the dashboard. Now, this is one of my test sites that I created before, but what I want you to do is click on new site from Git. And I'm going to specify GitHub because I'm using GitHub. And uh, in my uh, search repo, these are the repositories that are allowed, that um, GitHub is allowing Netlify to see. And to change it, I just need to configure the new Netlify this. And if I go there, I can specify the last one that I've just created and I called it front end URL Shona. That is it. Okay, and I save it. Okay. And as you can see here, I have it right here. So this is going to be the repository that Netlify is going to keep watch, keep watching. Now I want to branch, I want to deploy the main branch, of course. And right here, I don't have any build command or any basic directory. We just want to say it's the dist. So just publish the dist. Netlify is going to see the index.html and it's going to upload that. If I now do a deploy site like this, it should take really, really short time. It says that it's published. And right here, you have the name of your website. Now, this is kind of a strange name. So you can you can change it if you want. You can even add a custom domain. You need to pay for that. But uh, in this case, I can just maybe this is too random. Just uh, say URL shortener uh, YouTube. Why not? Let's see if this is available. It is. So now this is going to be the endpoint for our uh, website. Let's visit and see if everything works correctly. All right. So as you can see, our front end is at this endpoint. And take good notice of this address because this is what we're going to need later uh, in the server on the server side. Now it comes the moment for the server. Okay, now um, to deploy with Roku, we need to follow basically the same uh, logic as before. So since I want to, I'm going to clear the screen. Since I want to, I'm going to change directory as well, so that I'm in my root folder. I want to deploy just the server side. I'm going to do basically the same thing. So I'm going to go inside that folder and I'm going to init it. Now this is being watched. But now this needs another remote repository, okay? I can say git status as well to see the files. I got the .env, node modules, package. There are a few things right here that I don't want to be tracked, like the node modules. There is no need for that. .env especially. This contains all the secrets, environment variables that I set. So I don't want this to be exposed. To do that, I can create what is called a git ignore file. You can do that just by typing git ignore. This is going to create a git ignore file. If I list all of them, you can see that it is right here. And we can specify the files we don't want to track. You can use nano if you're on a Unix based machine. Nano is a basic text editor. And the file you wanna, yeah, the file you wanna open. Now, inside here, you can specify the name of the folders and files that you don't want to be tracked. .env is one, node modules is the other one. And also 
this thing that keeps appearing on Mac machines, which is really not something you want, and it's a dot here. Okay, once you change it, Control X, yes to modify it, enter, just keep the, the exact name. And if I now read while it's on my git ignore file, you can read that I got just this. If this worked, if I now say git status, I shouldn't see this. And as a matter of fact, I don't see the node modules because they're not tracked. I don't see the .env, that's perfectly fine. Now, as before, I need to git add all these files and I need to commit these files, okay? Let's say first commit. Now, as before, I need to create a GitHub repository. So let's create it here. Let's go to our own page, repository, and let's say new. This is gonna be my backend URL shortener. Shortener. And this is Node.js. Um, backend for Node.js application. Okay, and I just create it. And these are basically the commands that I need to run again on the terminal. So the first one is git branch, capital M main. Now I need to add the remote repository, which is this one. And so I just copy paste this. Okay, now I have it. If I see git remote, I have a remote called origin um, with this URL. And last but not least, I need to push my changes origin main. This basically is push it to the origin um, repository and uh, push the main branch. That's basically what it means. It's going to do its thing. And if I go here and reload, I now have everything I need inside here. Okay. Beautiful. Now it comes the moment, let's clear the screen, to actually create the, to deploy the, the, the thing with Heroku. And to start off with, we follow the instruction in Heroku, we need to run this command, Heroku create, which is going to create another repo, another remote repository, but this time for Heroku, like this. Now it's creating the app, perfect. And this is the URL of the app. Now it is ugly because it is ugly, but this is just how it works. It's a random name. You can change it. You can put a uh, customized a domain, but you need to pay, of course. This is the free option. And this URL is actually fundamental for one thing that I'm gonna speci specify in a bit. Now that we got uh, Heroku Create, we can set, we can see all the remotes that we got available. And you can see we got two, well, it's basically one more remote at this address, okay? The next thing we need to do is to push our changes to our Heroku main. But there is one more thing that we need to do, because if you remember, if I now go here, we have a .env file, and in, inside here, we have some environment variables. Now, if I open it, uh, this has not been pushed in the remote repository, so I need to specify these environment variables in your Heroku. The first one is the Mongo URI. You're gonna use yours. The second one is the type of environment. I'm gonna put production. And last but not least is this one. This is going to be changed with the new HTTP, the new URL of our application, because that is going to compose the basically shortened URL. I can select a Roku and config. I have access to the config file and I'm gonna set set. Right now I am setting environment variables. The first one I want to set, it's ENV. And this time it's going to be production because I'm gonna be in production. As you can see, exactly, I have it. The second I'm gonna set is the URL. And the URL is going to be exactly this. 
All right. Let me see if I got to see one thing if I return it with a slash. OK, so there's no need for this slash right here. All right. OK, and if I just hit the config, I'm going to see no git config. No, it's not git config, Marco. It's Roku config. You can see my two environment variables, env and url. Last but not least, the most important. So Roku config set. And this is the Mongo URI. And here I need to put quotes because there are going to be many symbols and stuff. And I just want to, this to be uh, to be read as a string. So I'm going to go to my .env file. You're going to select your, of course, yours, yours URI. And I'm going to copy paste this one inside here. Beautiful. Let's see if everything is fine. Yep. Okay. It's set. Perfect. Now let's clear the screen. Okay. Now that I've set the environment variables, I can run this command, git push Heroku main. So I'm going to push on the main branch of the Heroku repository all the things that I have here. And this should build the API. We're going to test it anyway, but this should build it. Let's see how long it takes. Should it take long actually? Okay, so it is done. And the thing you want to see in this case is, is always this message, build succeeded. We know that uh, it actually succeeded. This is the end point of our API and we can visit it right now. Uh, let's go somewhere around here. Let's see it here. And if I now hit this, I got my home page message. If I type URLs, I should get all the URLs that are in the, in the database. And this is just to test. I'm going to get rid of it later. And as a matter of fact, it returns all the, the, the records that I have in my database. So I got the Reddit, the GitHub. Well, I've added some of this so that to test if it works. And as you can see, my app is now deployed. My API is now working. Now, what I need to do to connect these two things is to change one small thing into my front end. So if I go to my terminal, well, actually go here. Why not? And I go to my index.js. If you remember here, I've addressed the API from this URL. But now this URL is not uh, is not working anymore. It's not on my local host. I need to put this API now because this URL because my API is now here. And I'm gonna do this, then API, and then short. Okay. And I'm gonna save it. Now that I saved it, I have some changes. VS Code tells me that I have a change, and I can even commit it from here. I've changed something in my index.js, so I can just stage it. I'm going to put a message and say changed URL for API. Say OK. And then I'm going to push. Beautiful. Now, just to check it, if everything is correct, I can check in my uh, front end URL shown and I can see if everything. So we have the change message. And if I go in my public and index.js, you can see that this has changed. And if I go to my Netlify app and I say my site overview, you can see that it has just published another version. And this is what amazing about Netlify is basically watching my GitHub repository. And every time I push, every time I push a change, it's going to rebuild and republish the website. So now this website uh, already has the changes that I've done without me adding anything to it. Now I want to test it. This is uh, it. I'm going to reload it. And let's see if everything works correctly. I'm going to console log. 
And uh, let's, I don't know, uh, GitHub, why not? I can close this. Let's go to GitHub, okay? And this is my GitHub, but anyway, Command C, Command V. Let's see if this works. Wow. As you can see, now I have basically the shortened URL. Now you can see that it's not very short, but when you de deploy things on Heroku uh, for free, you're gonna get this herokuapp.com. If you want to get rid of it, just select the, the paid version and get a custom domain, and you can have whatever you want in here. Now, the real um, test here is, if I now select this, I should be redirected to the GitHub homepage or this page. Now I'm logged in, so I'm gonna see my dashboard. But this should work. Let's see if it does. And it does. Guys, it works, it is deployed, it is online. And as you can see, everything was for free. Heroku is for free and Netlify is for free. We've, uh, we have integrated it with, uh, with our GitHub repositories. We've basically done everything through the terminal. I mean, this is pro stuff. This is really pro stuff. And every time you're gonna make changes, you're gonna push it to the, you know, Heroku repository so that they can be directly updated in the uh, deployed server as well. Now, there is something that I want to uh, change here. And let's see if changes work as well as I said. If I go to my server and I want to remove these uh, course headers. As I said, now this as like an origin star. So basically it's accepting all the origins. And I don't want that. I want my API to basically respond only to one specified origin. Now that I have my front end develop, uh, deployed, I can go to my front end copy and I want to do this. And I'm gonna call it Let's call it whitelist for now. And it's gonna be a string, it's gonna be this address, okay? Inside here, I'm gonna put some option, and the first option is origin. And this origin is gonna be whitelist, okay? Now, if I save, and I go on my terminal, and I do my git status, I should see ch some changes. As a matter of fact, I have changed the server.js. So what I can do is git add, git commit, m, and I say edit whitelist uh, website. And then I can just push, okay? And this will push somewhere. I need to specify that I need to push to the origin. Okay, this has pushed to the origin repo. To push to the Heroku repo, I need to just specify Heroku, like this. If I can spell it correctly, it might even work better, like this. In this single command, not only is going to push it, but it's also going to rebuild the entire API. If I now do this, it's gonna, well, run its things. Beautiful, so the build succeeded, and now I have my changes right there. Let's reload this. HTTPS, google.com. I think we already have this, but let's try. And that is because, ha, huh, there is a slash. Are you kidding me? I shouldn't have put this slash. Okay, let's do it again. No problem.
Well, even though we've been blocked, we actually I've actually verified that it works because right now the two things don't match because uh, the request was made from this URL and in the whitelist has specified a URL with a slash. So it's a very small mistake. But again, uh, I've just tested the fact that uh, the course policy works. So if it doesn't come from that URL, it is not accepted. So I can now, let's do this, reload this. And I can copy paste like this and I do this. And it works. Yoohoo! Beautiful. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, we're done for real this time. Thank you very, very much. Woo! That was a long one. I really hope that you could learn something from this video. As you saw, it is very easy to deploy an app with Heroku and Netlify. There are multiple solutions. Most of them are like not free, not for free, but definitely this is a very good solution because it is very easy and uh, it offers a good integration. Managing the entire app via Git, GitHub, I mean, it's, it's really, really good. For this video, it is all, uh, this project is done. I really hope that you could learn something. Again, let me know in the comments below one project that you might want to see developed on this channel. And also, if you enjoyed this video and enjoy the content, leave a like and share so that more people can see it. And don't forget to subscribe. That will really, really help this channel. This being said, I hope to see you at the next video. As always, stay tuned for more and bye bye.